So welcome to Sweden's first global food system dialogue, where we will discuss the pathways towards equitable food systems. Uh, this dialogue is brought to you by the Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation, the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA, the International Fund for Agriculture Development, IFAD, and the Swedish International Agriculture Network, SIANI. My name is Jonathan Eng, and I work as a network coordinator at SIANI, and I am the curator for this dialogue. In September this year, the world will convene at the first ever UN Food Systems Summit to discuss and kick off a food systems transformation and an agenda for action to 2030. The food systems of today are generating unwanted effects such as hunger and malnutrition and have a huge impact on our environment and climate. And it's clear that urgent and bold action is needed now. So in the process leading up to the Food Systems Summit, all UN member states have been invited to hold national dialogues in preparation for the summit. Sweden held its first national dialogue in January, and since then two regional dialogues have been held as well. And the dialogue that we're holding here today is the first in a series of three dialogues that complements the other Swedish dialogues, but with a global perspective. And combined, these dialogues will inform Sweden's preparation for the Food Systems Summit fit in perspectives directly to the summit secretariat, as well as contribute to shape Sweden's future international development cooperation. And today we'll be start by hearing from a few inspiring speakers discussing equitable food systems uh, with a special focus on the rights of indigenous peoples and youth. And the discussion today is relating to the fourth action track in the food system summit. And later in the spring, the other dialogues will uh, relate to action track five and action track three. But what is really important to note already here is that they, this day is not about the conveners or the speakers that you will hear from now. It's about you and you are all here to discuss and brainstorm and think of ways to reach equitable food systems. Some of you might have worked discussing these topics your whole life and for some discussing these issues is new. And we have participants calling in from all around the world from countries such as India, Kenya, Somalia and Sweden. And we believe that everyone has something to contribute with because every day, all of us are interacting with food systems in one way or another. And we must all be part of a transformation to make them sustainable and inclusive. So the dialogue today starts here in plenary where we will hear from a range of speakers with a lot of knowledge and expertise on food systems. And then in about an hour time, we will send you in to uh, breakout groups where you will discuss visions for our future systems in small teams. And I will explain more about how this workshop will work later. And we also have an amazing team of facilitators and note takers with us that will make it work and ensure that everyone feels comfortable and is giving the opportunity to speak. And before ending today's session, we will meet back here in plenary and report back from the group discussions. Uh, and don't worry, we will of course ensure that you will get a break and get some more coffee and look away from your screens for a while. But now it's time for me to introduce you to our opening speaker, uh, Karin Jemtin is the Director General of the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA, who is co-hosting this dialogue with us today. Karin, the screen is yours. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to open and welcome you all to this important um, meeting, to this important talk and dialogue on an important issue. Uh, colleagues and friends, uh, again, uh, welcome to uh, this morning's days or evenings, wherever you are in the world, to this anyway, very, very important discuss discussion. Welcome. And the digital um, format gives us very much an opportunity of meeting, meeting and discussing a topic, an important topic, and meeting and, uh, and discussing across boundaries, across borders and across the globe. It's a fantastic opportunity. Let's grab it today. It's an honor for me to open this round table on equitable food systems with a focus on youth and indigenous populations. And of course, an extra welcome to all of you representing those groups. Uh, but you are all welcome, no matter what group you, you represent, of course, but youth and indigenous populations very much takes a part in this discussion and we should uh, make it possible for them to, to have the power in your own hands. For global food systems to be inclusive and to work better and more sustainably, we have to meet and discuss ways forward. 
we have to, in common, find solutions in how um, nutrition, feeding, and how hunger can be reduced and not increased as it currently is on the glo globe. We need to listen to each other with big ears, uh, and we need to learn from each, each other to find common grounds and solutions for the future. This is what the UN Food System Summit is about. This is what it will address in New York in, July, in, in September and in Rome in July. At this stage, all countries in the world prepare their own national dialogues to feed their concerns, views and solutions into these meetings. Sweden is fully engaged in the dialogue, uh, in, in the whole process of dialogues actually. And to today's meet, uh, roundtable meeting contributes with an international perspective to the Swedish dialogues. Uh, as was said by Jonathan before, this process is led by the Swedish Ministry for Enterprise and Innovation. And the dialogues are in full swing. This week, there will be two other national dialogues held in Södertälje and Hanusand. Uh, they will have other focuses, of course, than this dialogue. I would also, in my introduction, like to recognize Siani. Siani is a long-term partner of SIDA. Thank you for helping us arranging today's roundtable. And we look forward to the forthcoming two roundtable discussions that we'll, we will host jointly, one in April and one in May, focusing respectively on resilience and boosting nature positive solutions. We are grateful for your support, but most of all, we are grateful for your partnership with us. Hunger and malnutrition remain the uttermost manifestation of absolute poverty. We see today an increase in hunger. We see an increase in mal malnutrition. We actually see an increase in famine. Around 700 million people do not get enough food today on a daily basis. So to achieve SDG 2, which is the target on zero hunger, in the remaining nine years, we have to do a lot more. We have to transform food system. We have to transform them in a way so that food actually is, there is enough nutritious food for everyone everywhere. CEDA, we are an international development agency and our primary goal is of course, to eradicate poverty and poverty in all senses. When, support, when supported agriculture and food production, we have supported uh, agriculture and food production, including food systems since the early 1960s. And still today, a significant amount of our support address food production in different ways mainly through supporting small-scale farmers, including, of course, female farmers in the Global South. Inclusive food systems ensure that all people in the world have access to good food, nutritious food, and to healthy diets. And this is what the right to food is about. We have also supported minority and indigenous groups for decades. We recognized the knowledge and practices of their sustainable food systems. For instance, it's linked to biodiversity. And your guidance for a more sustainable future of food systems is of great importance. And increasingly, CEDA is working with young people as a powerful group for transforming status quo into a common sustainable future. Young people in rural villages, as well as in large cities, carry enormous power for change, also for better and more inclusive food system. The world should listen more to you. And that is important now more than ever before. Dear friends, with these words, I would like to welcome you again to this uh, round table. I was about to say this morning's round table, but it could be evening or afternoon, wherever you are, but just to this round table, preparing for the Food System Summit later on this year. 
And most importantly, this round table is one of very many pieces of, of the puzzle preparing us for delivering better on sustainable goal, uh, sustainable development goal number two and doing it for all. Because the underlying aim of the sustainable development goals is delivering in a way that no one is left behind. And that should be the aim also when we deliver on SDG 2. Welcome to this round table on food system, on, on food summit, on, on food systems uh, in a broad sense. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Corinne. Uh, and we will hear more from Corinne Jantin later in this session today in a discussion about youth and indigenous populations in food systems. But it's now time for me to introduce you to our first keynote speaker, uh, Amita Baviskar. And Amita is a professor of environmental studies and sociology and anthropology at Ashoka University in India. Amita, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for inviting me to this symposium. I have nine minutes, so I'm going to be very, very brief. Who do we talk, who do we mean when we talk about indigenous people? Well, first of all, we're talking about people who often have distinct cultures and communities, people who are often anchored culturally to particular local environments, people who tend to be uh, tend to live in uh, close knit social groups with distinctive cultures, especially languages. And we know that the cultures that I just referred to are often thought of by dominant communities as quote unquote backward. And there are state government uh, attempts to try and assimilate people into the mainstream in the name of uplift or improvement. A key element of the, um, of the oppression and cultural dominance that uh, indigenous communities have faced historically is to do with the way in which the land-based resources on which they depend, forests, uh, the commons, the land, have been alienated from them in the name sometimes of conservation. So today, most indigenous people live in a situation where the most basic resources that they need for their subsistence and for their cultural survival are denied to them, a tendency that has only increased in India, at least since the 1990s, when economic liberalization has taken away more resources from indigenous people in order to uh, divert them towards the cause of economic growth, causing great inequality among populations. So for most indigenous people today, life is deeply precarious because it means living on a shrinking land base and, to, and uh, on nature-based resources to which they have little access, resources that are increasingly being degraded by the larger economic processes at work, which means that more and more uh, of indigenous people live like this, as laborers, as uh, migrants into an urban or um, agriculturally intensive uh, environment where they are particularly vulnerable. But in their own lands, what kinds of livelihood strategies do indigenous people use? I'm going to draw mainly from my own fieldwork in Central India to point out the way in which most indigenous people, at least in India, still try to hold on to an extremely diverse set of livelihood strategies, which are ingenious and creative responses to the kind of structural conditions of state oppression that they confront. So in this um, picture, what you see, for instance, is a diverse multi-cropping strategy along a river bank which has now been dammed, but uh, the river has been dammed, the river Narmada, but um, people still fish. Uh, they also use the forests above the, uh, their villages in order to collect all kinds of forest produce. Um, most of all, they also keep livestock and it's the forest that are, gives them the grazing resources to be able to, um, to maintain herds of goats, to keep poultry and so on. And it must be noted that this dependence on the land, the forest, the river, 
livestock is a tot is is a is a very very sustainable ecological loop if people have the resources to be able to maintain it at the same th these are the kinds of forest produce that people collect these are the kinds of grains that they grow and it must be noted that most of the grains that people grow are millets they are hardy um, and that and they are also much more nutritious than the kinds of diets that are promoted by the state. The huge diversity of millets also reflects the huge diversity of agroclimatic and soil conditions within, um, within a large subcontinent like, like India. And it is this diversity that has been maintained for generations by the um, skills and resourcefulness of indigenous peoples. However, this model of agriculture has not been supported by the government. What we have instead since the late 1960s is the so-called Green Revolution, a model of resource intensive agriculture concentrated in certain areas, concentrated also on certain crops, monocultures of wheat and rice. And uh, this kind of water intensive, fossil fuel intensive, chemical intensive agriculture is where the government has concentrated its investment with the result that areas where people um, dependent on the monsoon rains, dryland agriculture, where people practice a diverse copy, a set of cropping strategies integrated with the larger commons of forest, pasture, water bodies has been severely neglected. This policy of concentrating on certain areas has resulted in the ability to provide basic food grain across the country. Um, what you see here are, um, and is the transport of wheat, um, which is subsidized and provided at low prices across the country to poor, uh, to poor families. But what this does mean is the wiping out of the kinds of local diverse diets that existed before and the spread of wheat and rice to people who did not eat these things before. And this is a kind of cultural dominance that prevails. At the same time, what we see increasingly, and this is deeply worrying since the 1990s when economic liberalization began, is the deep penetration of processed foods, basically junk foods, into people's diets in small packets which are cheap and easy to afford. And these kinds of junk foods uh, are becoming a larger part of local people's diets, even in uh, indigenous people's diets. And what they're displacing is the kind of nutritious, wholesome food that people ate before. Let me also note that these kinds of, um, these kinds of processed foods are pushed by very large multinational corporations. They are, uh, their marketing is supported by glamorous film stars and cultural icons. And therefore, these kinds of foods have become much more uh, integrated into people's aspirations, their sense of what the good life is all about. And this, these set of aspirations also mean that people strive to emulate the green uh, revolution model of agriculture with all its capital and resource intensity, even when it is something that they can't afford to do, even when it lands them into debt. In order to have food security, what do people need? Well, people should either be able to grow food, they should either be able to buy food, or they should be able to get food from the state through different kinds of welfare programs. Let's first deal with what it would require to grow food in a way that gives people the kind of control over their, um, over their diets in the ways in which they would like. As I said earlier, land, water, and the commons have gradually been taken away from the people who depended on them the most and who historically had prior rights to them. So the first necessity in order to make sure that people have access to, uh, to food uh, in a sustainable way is to make sure that people have property rights to the resources that they need in order to be able to um, grow what they want. And the kinds of diversions and displacements and dispossession that has been taking place needs to be fought against at all kinds of levels. 
Second, government investment needs to be um, needs to be diverted away from areas where the green revolution style of agriculture has already created a huge ecological and social crisis reflected in the farmer protest going on in India just now, and that investment needs to uh, be put into soil and water conservation in all kinds of areas, especially dryland areas, which have been neglected so far. There is also the huge problem of the way in which the so-called expertise uh, of the Green Revolution has taken away people's sense of their own cultural knowledge. And uh, there has been this problem of de-skilling that a lot of indigenous uh, communities now no longer um, do the kinds of traditional practices that they used to, women holding on to heirloom seeds, uh, people knowing how to judge soil conditions, how to plant particular things because they were appropriate given the, um, you know, given that year's, uh, you know, configuration of rainfall or, uh, or heat and so on. Um, so what we need to focus also on is the way in which people's own knowledge can be strengthened and revived. Besides growing food, people need to be able to afford food if they need to buy it from the market. We know that most farmers uh, in India are, um, and probably elsewhere as well, are net buyers of food as well. They don't grow enough to see them through the year, or they don't grow everything that they want to eat. The key problem here are the low wages that people get as part of the precariat. And here, what we need to do uh, is to strengthen the movements for the right to employment, make sure that those um, laws which make employment available, guarantee employment to people are implemented. And um, we need to make sure that people are able to afford food in ways which they can't right now. The third thing people need is access to state welfare. And this, as we know, has been deeply inadequate. India, for instance, is allegedly self-sufficient in food grains, but, that, but those food grains don't reach um, huge numbers of people, what, uh, what does reach, even in that inadequate form, is usually wheat and white rice. And this has given rise to an epidemic of type 2 diabetes across the country. So what state welfare needs to, uh, uh, needs to address is the need for total nutrition and especially the need for culturally appropriate diets. I can't stress this enough because part of what indigenous people face uh, is also, as I said earlier, cultural domination. And in the Indian case, this means that they are supposed to uh, aspire to eating what high caste Hindu norms dictate as quote unquote good food, which means vegetarianism. Whereas in most parts of India, most people have eaten a nutritious diet that consists of all kinds of, uh, of, of food items, including uh, meat and fish and so on. Uh, but however, even eggs are not served in school midday meals because that in, in several states, because state norms say that eggs are quote unquote bad for you. So what we need to do by way of state welfare is also get that to accommodate the variety of people's cultural choices in a way that is much more egalitarian. My last point, we need to strengthen and revive local agroecological agro systems because these are best adapted to climate variability. These protect people from market volatility and they help reduce their vulnerability to all the increased kinds of insecurities that currently drive their life. This means the, the struggle is really for rights to, of access and control to the commons, to private lands, rights to make state welfare much more responsive to people's uh, needs, as well as to their particular cultural lifestyles. This means greater state investment so that people get adequate incomes. And finally, it means helping people to recover their cultural confidence as indigenous people, as people who have over centuries evolved particular ways of living with the land that today hold a lesson for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amita, um, for a very interesting and inspiring keynote. In the workshop today, we will discuss visions for our future food systems with a focus on achieving equitable food systems. And I just want to hear from you 
really quickly and shortly, even though it's a very broad and big question. If you, if you were to visionize and think very broadly, where do you think we need to go? How could an equitable food system look like? I think we see a lot of efforts already to bring that, uh, that equitable food system around. Uh, but many of these efforts, because they naturally start from particular local agroecologies, uh, tend to be uh, tend to be low um, tend to don't, tend to not have the resources to form the kinds of networks that they need in order to make a difference at the policy level. So even when we have certain states who you know mention a commitment to moving towards more uh, ecologically sustainable farming systems. Uh, we find that there is the fear that they are more likely to come together with large corporate organizations in ways where state rollout of these programs tends towards homogeneity, towards principles which actually go against the kind of localized uh, adaptive, uh, you know, adaptive measures that we're talking about. Um, this, I think, is a key issue that needs to be addressed, namely a network of local efforts coming together and then putting pressure at the national level. At the national level, because of mobilization around issues like say forest rights, rights to land, rights to employment, we see that there is legislation in place, but the spirit of that legislation has really been um, carried out in terms of actually realizing it on the ground. The results are really piecemeal. So we need a much more vigorous civil society effort to make sure that, for instance, employment guarantee schemes are not used to just get people to keep, you know, relaying the same road year after year, but in order to build resources that last, investing in the land, in soil and water conservation and so on. So what I see is a mixture of uh, people experimenting on the ground with localized strategies and the, the um, and, and you know the weaving together of these kinds of strands in order to put pressure on national uh, policies. But one element which always gets left out when we talk about indigenous people and you know their relationship with the land, with the state, and so on, is this element that I can't emphasize enough, which is the role of multinational corporations, the kinds of diets that they're pushing, and the actions that need to be taken internationally to try and get them to, um, to, to, to actually impoverishing people's diets in the ways in which they are through their very, very you know, heavy marketing uh, rich uh, strategy of persuasion. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us today uh, for giving this keynote. We're now moving quickly from our first keynote to our second keynote speaker and the last keynote speaker of today, Rahul Antal. Uh, Rahul is a technical specialist on rural youth and social inclusion at the International Fund for Agriculture Development, IFAD. Uh, Rahul, the screen is yours. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. I'd like to extend warm greetings and best wishes to everybody in these rather bleak times. Um, so, as we all know, something is wrong with our food system. And I think Professor Babiska really brought that out as one example in one situation, but it's widespread and prevalent everywhere. We all feel it, we hear about it, we see it, and we most certainly eat it. And we can see how the current system has really churned out a number of intertwined crises, be them social, ecological, economic, and even our health and well being. So we know something revolutionary needs to happen. And the Food System Summit is not a one-off. It's really meant to be a foundation stone for transformational change in how we think and act about our food, centered around a crucial balance between people, the planet, and our plates. And I think the principle of inclusivity and leaving no one behind, as Karen was mentioning, are necessary non-negotiable ingredients to shaping that transformation. Inclusive worldviews, particularly those that encompass marginalized perspectives, don't just deepen our understanding of the elements of the current food ways, they directly contribute to improving the lives of communities and our ecosystem. So against that backdrop, I'd like to center the focus on a topic I'm most passionately familiar with, and that's the vital role young women and men play in our food systems who are often left behind and have traditionally been left behind in consideration of the dialogues. But first, I'd like to start with a few key characteristic considerations. Very often, young people are viewed as the future, 
Uh, oftentimes you'll hear the words say, you know, youth are the future. And although the intention is good spirited, it's really far from the case. And we should remind ourselves that youth are today and now. The second is a term that youth is often framed as a certain age bracket and categorized as almost a homogeneous group. And this simplification really obscures many important dimensions of what being a youth means and entails. Youth is a social construct that is better understood relationally as a transitional phase within the life course. And each person's youth transition and their relationship with food systems is uniquely shaped by specific intersections with multiple factors, including gender, age, ethnicity, cultural specificities, educational level, employment status, mobility, skills, and the list goes on and on and on, including intergenerational relationships. But those are just a handful among many, many other issues that young people face, which really makes them a highly heterogeneous group. I think that's also another thing that we have to keep in mind. And while we face, you know, young people face an array of challenges, we are well aware of the employment challenge that's really burdening about. So a large share of young people live in rural areas in developing countries where poverty is also overwhelmingly concentrated. And around the world, we know that young people are two or three times more unlikely than their adult counterparts to find decent employment opportunities. And those that are working are mostly in vulnerable, low paid jobs in the informal sector. In Africa alone, an estimated 440 million young people will enter the labor market by 2030, and a large portion of them will be in rural areas. But due to limited access to land, natural resource, finance and markets and poor working conditions, creating those employment opportunities that are decent and sustainable in the agri-food sector are particularly challenging. And as a result of these challenges, we see large amounts of youth unemployment, displacement and economic and forced migration, including conflict and landlessness. But yet we know that the agri-food sector is also a place for huge opportunity and it's a sector that really has the ability to absorb a growing labor force. So we really see like sort of like the potential and the problem in the same dimension. And the institution that I work for, IFAD, has really recognized the importance, and IFAD is the International Fund for Agricultural Development. We've really recognized the importance and the critical role that youth play in sustainable development. And I think our efforts are directed towards supporting young people to really grasp the opportunity and transform the agri-food sector into a sustainable source of good food, good nutrition, and decent income. So together with governments and other partners, we invest in agriculture to really integrate technology and entrepreneurship into smallholder farming and make the sector more attractive and profitable for young people, which is equally important. So a lot of our support goes into improving the education and training in rural areas and facilitate young people's access to particularly productive resources where they are often left out. But we also appreciate the need to be innovative with young people. Because for this to happen, we really need to consider how we challenge our approaches to engaging with young people. And by that, I really mean we need to challenge some of our conventional approaches and shape them more to be differentiated and dynamic when engaging with youth. This is a highly heterogeneous, highly mobile group of young people that need to, we need to engage with them differently. And so to do it, we also need to embrace a lot of innovation and we need to be daring in some ways to do that. So at IFAD, for example, we've recently initiated a pan-African program that's really focusing on looking at integrated agribusiness hubs that can reshape the creation of employment opportunities, focusing more on avenues such as green jobs in the agri-food sector. And the program really looks for means of taking advantage by applying a combination of innovative technologies that are green, developing talent, facilitating access to capital and markets, and enhancing business skills, all while bridging the access to vital services. And I think what is crucial over here is really focusing not just on what youth needs are, but also on what is the enabling environment. So looking at the demand and the supply side of interventions. And everybody within, you know, when we speak of value chains, we should be looking at everything all the way from producers right up until the end consumer. And so we do this by fostering meaningful partnerships across the spectrum with a broad set of actors within the private and public sectors. But serving youth is just one part of the solution. There's an important area that I want to draw specific attention towards, and that's young people and participation. And uh, young women and men bring, you know, a large amount of energy and dynamism, along with fresh perspectives that can be positively disruptive. Now that could potentially be critical in rethinking and acting out the change we're all interested in seeing. 
But sadly, for a long time, young people have been removed from the decision making process. Young women in particular, further down the line, and an indigenous young girl is perhaps the furthest. But as I said earlier, if these voices need to be at the forefront, we need to reverse this tradition. Youth are often perceived as inexperienced and yet to mature into decision-making processes. Even within grassroots organizations and civil society organizations, they are sometimes exempt from participating. So really recognizing the importance of their voices, what we do at IFAD is we work with young people to really build that confidence and empower them to take part in planning and implementation processes that make their voices heard. In fact, we're currently exploring means to establish a mechanism to evocatively consult and engage in dialogues with young voices. And when we set out to actually develop this mechanism, we operated uh, about five regional workshops last uh, late towards the beginning of last year to really get young people to present their ideas of what such a platform should look like. And interestingly, through this process, we also learned that young voices are often disconnected and youth are not the best organized groups at the grassroots level and are often fragmented, very little resources to keep them afloat. So offering a space for young people to contribute our projects is not enough. We need to do more to ensure that such spaces are cultivated at the grassroots level amongst communities, nationally with governments and, uh, and amongst all relevant actors across all levels. So that building the agency of young people must go hand in hand with ch changing the relational dynamics, be them in the formal or informal spheres, and transforming those conventional structures, particularly the social norms that are premised on exclusionary practices. Which leaves me with the point which we often use as a principle uh, in IFAD is that we need to go beyond the principle of just offering ownership and start applying the principle of authorship, ensuring that youth-led initiatives are really created and owned by youth. Lastly, I'd like to emphasize that if we are to gear our approach towards a sustainable food system, we must go beyond thinking and acting systematically and entertain considerations for systemic thinking and practice. If the current COVID pandemic has shown us anything, it's that we live in a world where the interdependence of ecological, animal, and human health cannot be present in silos. It has really revealed what happens when we break down the natural barriers between animal and human populations. So the significance of the Anthropocene has really demonstrated the effect of the human footprint on our planet and the complex global system we all share today. It's shown us how systemically challenging our world has become. And in the same way, climate change, biodiversity, economic activity, and social stability are elements of the same one system. Hence, I'd really suggest that as we try to address systemic issues, we also try and adopt a thinking and acting that is more systemic as well in nature. So on that note, I'll wrap it up very quickly so that maybe we, there are some questions that I'm more than happy to answer, but thank you very much. Thank you, Rahul. Um, yeah, we at Ziani, we have arranged quite a few dialogues uh, on the topic of youth in food systems. And it's often been raised that, that youth should have the courage to engage in food systems. Um, but we know that there are a lot of structural barriers for youth to fully engage and participate. Could you quickly try to identify a few key actions that you think are needed for including youth in a transformation of food systems? Thanks. Uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. We often say that you should have the confidence and courage to engage in food systems. But we also, like I said earlier, need to ensure that the enabling environment also allows for it. And, you know, when uh, Ifad had uh, drafted a report back in 2000, I mean, it published a report, uh, the Rural Development Report in 2019. And it really, the entire report focuses on young people and there's a particular section that focuses on youth participation. And that really sort of unraveled some of, you know, more diagnostics of how youth are really engaging in a meaningful way. And it kind of breaks it down into looking at the different typologies of such mechanisms for youth engagement. And one of them is like a consultative mechanism, like workshops and assemblies. Another one is collaborative mechanism, like panels, boards, steering committees. Another one is empowering mechanism, which are really youth-owned institutions. And I think when we look at those brackets, we really realize that the consultative uh, sort of mechanisms often fall in the trap of being tokenistic. And I think we should try and wear away from that. It's, it is engaging to some degree, but not to a level which is meaningful. 
Uh, the second um, collaborative is, you know, it allows for some amount of decision making and a move in a positive direction, but nothing competes with more empowering mechanisms that really are appreciative of, you know, empowering young people to be ultimate participants in such mechanisms. But participation mechanisms need accounting for the heterogeneity, as I was saying earlier, and the diversity of youth cohorts. And this is an absolute crucial element. And for example, often when consultative processes are opened or when policies are drafted or actions are developed, there may be far more focus on urban youth and little or nothing on rural youth or amongst elder youth and not on younger youth or with a neglect to certain ethnic or cultural sensitivities. So it needs to be sort of encompassing in that sense. And there's also a need to have an all round receptiveness, you know, and particularly political receptiveness for implementing participation mechanisms. And that itself is a first step. I think another second step would really be that to make sure that, you know, the participation is meaningful, that general development strategies must really take place at the same time and encompass that, reducing the marginalization and allowing for more authentic participation to take place. But for this to also materialize, we need to consider also the focus on building the asset base of youth organized groups and networks themselves. They need to really have the human and financial capital to sustain themselves. Um, and so finally, I think also there are you know, new forms of participation and the opportunity for improved connectivity, which can really be transformational in how we think about improving participation particularly with technological advancements in the internet. I think this is an opportunity in front of us to see how moving forward, we can sort of also take into consideration those issues. So to conclude, agency is not, it's not only empowering young people to have the courage to participate, as you were saying, in decision-making process. It's really finding the ways where their participation can be more meaningful and less tokenistic. It means that we should also be focusing on efforts on the enabling environment at the local, the national, the regional and international levels. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think both you and Amitna Baviskar have given us a lot to think about when we move into the workshop session uh, later today, uh, when all of us in the audience will also be part of this discussion. And we're now moving into the final part of the inspira inspiration session before moving into the workshop. Uh, and we will now listen to a conversation about the way towards equitable food systems with a special focus on how to ensure that we include youth and indigenous populations. It was originally planned that my team Yu Moon, who's the vice youth chair of the Action Track 4 in the UN Food Systems Summit should have participated in this conversation. Uh, but unfortunately, my team Yun Moon is not able to join us today. Uh, she's currently in Myanmar and the uh, very current developments in the country made it impossible for her to join. Uh, we wish her and her friends and family well and hope that we will be able to reconnect at a later time. But in this conversation, we still have two very interesting speakers with us. Uh, we're going to welcome back Karin Yemtin, who's the Director General of CEDA, to the table. Uh, she will be joined by Levi Yuma, who is an experienced youth development practitioner and community mobilizer. Uh, Levi is the program officer at the organization Youth Alive Kenya, working with uplifting youth to overcome their unique challenges and actively participate in the formation of their society and country. And finally, I want to introduce you to Hanna Sinare, who will lead this conversation. Hanna Sinare is a researcher at Stockholm Resilience Center. And Hanna's research has focused on human environment interactions in smallholder agricultural landscapes in West Africa and their links to broader food systems. And currently she's focusing on how youth aspirations and perceived opportunities and constraints in agriculture match with youth and agriculture policies in Burkina Faso. Hanna, I will now hand over to you to lead this conversation. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, great to have you here, Karin and Levi. Um, I would like us uh, to start off with the vision. So we are discussing how we can move towards equitable food systems. Um, and if you envision, let's say in 2050, so it's quite far into the future, so change can happen, but still maybe future can be tangible, so a bit tangible. Um, what um, if we have reached uh, and or improved um, substantially on equitable food systems uh, 
Levi, if you think about where you work uh, or where you come from, uh, what are the main characteristics uh, in the food system uh, that have changed in such a, uh, a future where we have reached uh, an equitable food systems? Thank you, Anna. Um, I will start by first uh, mentioning that uh, um, a lot have been said by Rahul and uh, touched more on uh, young people, which I think was very much critical. But looking at the question in regards to equitable food security system, first in the general concept of the Kenyan Republic, because I work in Kenya as a program officer for an organization called Youth Alive Kenya, one of the big four agendas for the country is on food security. And that is more or less like a, a policy framework for government to uh, have a, a sustainable food security for its population. But when you are speaking about the context of the youth, uh, I will pick from what Raul said uh, lastly. We need to have more strengthened collaborations because one of the most important thing is uh, the youth, or as we at times said, young people. Now the social construct of youth defined between a particular age group or particular age set and the young people now, those are the elder youth. We need to realize how can we uh, have a support system of collaboration, but also looking at, again, the other thing that is said on asset base, on building the human resource and the finance capital of youth people, of young people. Uh, for Kenya, again, uh, some of the characteristics that have been there, one, there's been the aspect of uh, land ownership. You realize for land ownership, for us, it's about the people who tell it. And the uh, majority of people who have uh, ownership to these lands or who are in agriculture are the elderly compared to the youth. Uh, secondly, when you look at the context of engaging with also young people is also the community is more engaged in small ownership of those parcels of land. They are not factored in into large scale uh, uh, agricultural systems, but also we are also looking at uh, the recent developments that are there, trying to engage young people in uh, agribusiness because the agribusiness has a, a greater value chain. It is not just telling the land, but what are the other incentives within it? Who is involved in probably issues of uh, uh, marketing, issues of digitization or mechanization? So these are the other areas that we need to conform with. But another thing also that uh, as a characteristic into the Kenyan uh, food security systems is the policies that are in place. You realize Kenya has moved from an, um, one land ownership because in terms of ownership in our context we have private land ownership we have community ownership uh, and also we have uh, those aspects of freehold and leasehold but again all land is owned by the government but the context of ownership of the land is also critical because again it's owned by uh, families or the elderly that's make it also difficult for youth to engage in agriculture because before you in, you, you participate or you are involved in this uh, engagement that focus on food security, you have to seek probably permission from your parents. At the same time, the policies are not favorable for you. And again, you know, as young people for us, the changing in the, in the, in the modern world is land or tilling of the land for food is for the elderly. So that is the greatest challenge that we have. Uh, the other characteristics is again, issues about uh, um, the labor force. Again, I've mentioned the labor force is mainly dominated by, again, the older generation since uh, time immemorial. So it's something also we need to focus on how can we also have youth people to be part in uh, having sustainability. Another thing that I also work with is in terms of capacity development, because we've also moved from tilling the land in terms of food production to just agriculture that you go to the farm. But in terms of uh, capacity development, We've, we need to, in, to engage with the, the government officials. For example, we have the agricultural extension officers because again, agri food security is not just focused on food production, but we also look at what is there like, apart from the maize and beans, like the staple food for Kenyan is Ugali. What about those people who are venturing into issues around dairy farming, yeah? So how do we also engage with them? So critically for me, I feel we need to invest a lot with young people in issues around capacity development. But the most important thing is also to reference from what again Raul shared, how I am, are the youths meaningfully engaged in these processes in the decision-making in areas that affect them. I think that would be the most important thing. Anna? Yeah. Thank you, Levi. Yes, 
really interesting and I also agree that Raoul raised a lot of important points in his uh, keynote that also resonates with my experiences uh, from Burkina Faso and also what you say uh, about the intergenerational dynamics uh, and how uh, how we can facilitate for for youth that both uh, in relation to to land ownership uh, but also in, dynamics within families and how you get access to land and resources um, and what you said about capacity development that one thing could be to to have uh, access to credit uh, to invest yeah. in production or processing or, or in a trade uh, business but also the the capacity then to use the resource you get to actually uh, improve uh, improve your activity. Uh, so Karin, uh, when you listen to Levi, uh, what are you re reflex your reflections in relation to how Sweden works towards equitable food systems uh, more generally and factors that need to change and actors that need to be involved in food system transformation? Thank you, Hanna, uh, and thank you, Levi, for for your your words. Um, it's a it's a very very big question. Where are we in 2050, and where, what can Sweden do to to actually uh, make us closer to leaving no one behind and actually reaching having reached rather the sustainable development goals by 2050? Uh, at CEDA, we work with something called the multidimensional poverty analysis. Uh, for us, that's important because it it helps us actually analyzing, analyzing poverty in four dimensions. It's economic poverty, of course, but it's also lack of uh, power agency, uh, lack of security uh, and other dimensions that we actually analyzed before deciding who and what, who to support, what to support, and actually how to do our most, the smartest in, in, interventions actually to support um, the work towards uh, the sustainable development goals. So my hope is, of course, that more development agencies and more <coughs> structures will actually use tools similar to the multidimensional poverty analysis to be able to see the real gaps in society. Professor Baviskar's uh, interventions were very, very important with her and uh, her underlying actually making it possible for in indigenous peoples to have cultural confidence, uh, but also stressing the need for us, the, the, the ones of us who are not part of indigenous groups to actually give the power to indigenous groups and to make it possible for them to use their knowledge. And the same comes to young people when Raoul spoke about the, the, need, the need for all of us to actually recognize the knowledge and the situation of uh, the knowledge of young people, but also that being young is not a period of waiting. It's a period of participating and actually yeah, being a part of society with your own knowledge and your own role, role. But when you said 2050, it's 29 years ahead. It's 29 years till 2050. And I'm thinking that the world will be very different at that time, actually. And there would be two main streams or main characterizes of where, where poor people actually live. And that will be a challenge also when it comes to food systems. It's in urban areas. Many people will have moved to urban areas, making uh, the rural areas even more important so that we're not, we will not forget the rural people nor forget rural areas in different ways. So more people will live, live in urban areas. The other factor is that the majority of the poor, the people living in extreme poverty, will live in fragile or conflict contexts. And how will we make it possible for people living in fragile or conflict contexts to not only be receivers of food, but also producers? Uh, so 29 years ahead of us, I think that, that those two factors will be even more important when we use the multidimensional poverty analysis tool, actually. So yeah, those were my first interventions. Thank you, Karin. 
Um, and yes, uh, really important points that you that you raise um, how to uh, assure nutritious uh, good food in in urban areas where you have limited possibility to grow your own food and and um, yeah coming back to these employment opportunities that makes you uh, afford good food and that it's also accessible the more nutritional uh, nutritious uh, foods that may be um, grown in the country <clears throat> and not relying on only a few crops. Uh, so, uh, Levi, your organization, Youth Alive Kenya, you work for youth engagement and inclusion and to create secure uh, livelihoods for youth. Uh, can you give some practical examples on how you are uh, working with this, um, particularly relating to food systems? Thank you, Anna. Uh, as an organization working with young people, uh, for us, our key uh, engagement in this particular area, as you can see also behind my banner, we are speaking about decent work. And for us, the slogan for decent work basically speaks about uh, youth engagement, meaningful uh, youth engagement, meaningful communities engagement. So for us, our strategy for food security has been a lot on uh, uh, capacity building on young people, on uh, entrepreneurship and labor market. And you realize when you're speaking about uh, uh, entrepreneurship and labor market is to giving them alternatives of also being self-employed. And also the skills uh, development are not just targeted to the young people probably in, in uh, informal situations, but we focus also working with the, 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 the lowest uh, education system that we have in the Republic. That is the vocational training centers where the skills development is, is key. So the, the, the youths in those vocational training centers are also able to acquire the skills and knowledge in regards to training. Uh, for business, is also business and entrepreneurship is also to give them alternatives to self-employment rather than being dependent to formal employment as uh, youths. Uh, secondly, for us as an organization has been to have collaboration with governments because uh, government also provides some uh, uh, social capital to young people involved in uh, agribusiness, agriculture, or other spheres of engagement that they have with the young people. So for us, uh, the partnership is uh, on collaboration in linking the youth with these opportunities, because uh, for us, we have what is called the Youth Enterprise Development Fund, Women Enterprise Development Fund. So these funds are basically aligned to support the youth and women in their areas of uh, uh, support. So we're able to provide these uh, linkages with the youths for those opportunities. Uh, thirdly, as an organization, our work has also focused on policy advocacy. And for policy advocacy, uh, basically is to have uh, the processes, not the outcome. The processes in development of a policy is inclusive where youth participate, they're able to have their uh, views incorporated in the policy. But at the same time, they are also the key drivers in implementation of the policy. Uh, the other thing has also been uh, the aspect of budget uh, advocacy and for budget advocacy is uh, realigned to the specific uh, strategic focus areas for the county governments, because again, in the Kenyan government system, we have 47 counties. So within the 47 counties, we are able to influence budget advocacy in regards to youth priority issues. So if it is the areas of, un of employment, how are youth involved in employment? Areas of agriculture that focus on food security system, how are youth involved? Is this in terms of capitation? Is it in terms of uh, systems development where there are, are, are grants that support them? Is it issues around uh, machines and equipment in their farms? So we're able to have budget advocacy engagement with also the, the relevant stakeholders. Uh, finally, for us, uh, the key aspect has be also what as a, an organization and as a youth organization we leverage on on the digital platforms. How do we work with the young people using these digi digital platforms? But not everybody can access the digital platforms. We've also embraced what is called a bulk SMS, where we are able to give information on um, the recent happenings that are happening in whatever or whichever part of the Republic. So that has been our engagement with the youth. Yeah. Thank mm. you, Anna. Thank you, Levi. Yeah, it's really interesting that you, the different uh, uh, ways you are using. Um, so I, I just thought about what you said uh, lastly, that uh, that my experience from rural Burkina Faso, many are not using internet, but 
phones are there so that you also have this uh, SMS uh, uh, because uh, uh, often you hear about uh, the digital generation, but that's not the case everywhere. So it's really important to think about that. Uh, so Karin, um, in, in Sweden's work, uh, what do you do to ensure that youth and indigenous populations are included and participate in, in development cooperation, uh, particularly related to food systems? Yeah, as I said before, we, we always ensure that we use the multidimensional poverty analysis and try to reach the ones furthest left behind. And indigenous people, as well as young people, are often part of the, those being really left behind and needing um, more access to power and more access to, to uh, influencing their own uh, societies and, and countries. But what we concretely do is that we support um, Organizations such, such as IFAD, FAO, the World Bank, Oxfam, uh, but also the CIGAR and also big other um, uh, NGO civil society organizations, um, global, but also local organizations. We often work or most of the time work with core support. Sometimes we do so, uh, soft earmarking. Uh, and we always underline that they should work in, in line with the sustainable development goals and in line with actually reaching the ones needing it the most. And when looking at th things with that angle, one often sees that young farmers or young urban uh, population are the ones having the knowledge, but also the ones with the biggest needs in this, um, in, in this instance as well, in this area as well. Um, so in the, currently when we are supporting, we are supporting the, the cigar, uh, they are focusing on young farmers and agripreneurs. And in an ongoing FAO initiative, the purpose, uh, we have a, the purpose of that initiative is to boost decent jobs, uh, as Levi was speaking about, for youth in the agri-food system. In different ways we're doing the, this in, in all parts of the world. When, and when it comes to indigenous people, CEDA, we support indigenous people's assistance facility within EFAT. That would be one example of us actually directly supporting the, the strength and the voice of, of indigenous people also in this work. Thank you, Karin. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think uh, in the interest of time that we need to wrap up, uh, it was a very uh, interesting and, and engaging conversation that we could have uh, continued, I think. Uh, but uh, Jonathan, uh, I think we need to, uh, to move on. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. But thank you so thank much, you much. Uh, Hanna, Levi and Karin for this very interesting conversation. And I also want to thank everyone who has followed us through our live streaming on Facebook and hope that you will connect with us at future dialogues as well. And for us participating here in Zoom, it's now time for our workshop. We will also be able to be given a 10 to 15 minute break to stretch your legs, but we'll have that break once you've been sent out to your breakout rooms. Because we have divided you into 10 different groups that will discuss five different vision statements. And the majority of you here should prior to this meeting have been assigned to a business statement and informed about this over email. And I think that for some of you, it may feel as if you do not know enough about the topic that you've been assigned to, but we are certain that once the discussions get going, you will be able to contribute with your experience and learn from your fellow workshop participants. The visionary statements are broad and they should really be seen as visions. And this is an idea of where we want to go. You should think about how should we get there? What needs to be done? And do you think this vision is a good idea? So you were given uh, up until 11.25 uh, for this workshop, and this should then include a 10 to 15 minute break. And when you come back to your break, uh, when you come to your breakout rooms, you will be greeted by a facilitator uh, who will lead a workshop and they will help you guide you through it. Uh, and they will also go through the structure of the workshop once you are in your breakout rooms. There will also be a note taker there to ensure to capture everything that is being said. But it's very important here to note that during the workshop, Chatham House Rules applies. And this means that you're not allowed to quote anyone and you will also not be quoted with your name in the notes. 
And once you're back here at 11.25, we will report back from the discussions you had and hear from State Secretary Per Kallenberg on the ways forward in the Food System Summit process. But now I think we're ready to descend to our breakout groups. So Linda, please uh, do your magic. <laughs>